Hello, everyone. I'm Natalie Green, the Public Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. Tonight marks the final event of our three-year Literature for Justice program, with special thanks to our partner in books, The Million Book Project. Deepest gratitude to this evening's moderator, former Literature for Justice committee member, and selected author, and Million Book Project founding director, Reginald Dwayne Betts, and program manager, Tess Wheelwright for their collaboration. This evening's event will be edited into a bonus episode of the Million Book Projects podcast, The Freedom Takes, with additional thanks to producer extraordinaire, Aaron, and thanks to you all for joining us. Best known as the presenter of the National Book Awards, the National Book Foundation works year round to reach readers everywhere. Tonight, we're celebrating the third and final year of Literature for Justice which has curated annual reading lists focused on the topic of mass incarceration, inspired and supported by the Art for Justice Fund. What an honor it has been to work alongside 15 committee members and get to celebrate and uplift 17 edifying, transformative, and change-inspiring books the past three years. From poetry to fiction to nonfiction, these books have forever changed the way we as an institution think about literature, think about readers, and most definitely think about the carceral system. In addition to public events, this program and each year's committee has uplifted our efforts to get books into prisons and detention centers directly, which is at the heart and soul of the Million Book Project's beautiful Freedom Libraries Initiative. So to partner with Duane and Tess on this work felt only natural. We were proud to collaborate on getting 1,000 copies of Literature for Justice titles, including Becoming Miss Burton and The Mars Room, to reading groups around the country. I keep saying last and final, but in some iteration or another, we plan to keep these partnerships and book distributions going for years to come. If you're able to, you can support our efforts at nationalbook.org donate. And now for this evening's program. Susan and Rachel will read from their work and join Duane in conversation. We'll drop a bookshop link in the chat to buy their books and all of the Literature for Justice reading list titles, with thanks to our partner, Loyalty Bookstores in Washington, D.C. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. Susan Burton founded a New Way of Life reentry project in 1998, dedicating her life to helping other women break the cycle of incarceration. A New Way of Life provides resources such as housing, case management, employment, and more. Susan received the Citizen Activist Award from the Harvard Kennedy School, the Encore Purpose Prize, and the James Irvine Foundation Leadership Award, and was named a top 10 CNN hero and one of 18 new civil rights leaders in the nation by the LA Times. Her memoir, Becoming Miss Burton, received a 2018 NAACP Image Award and the inaugural Goddard Riverside Stefan Russo Book Prize for Social Justice. Rachel Kushner is the author of the internationally acclaimed novels, The Mars Room, The Flame Throwers, and Telex from Cuba, as well as a book of short stories, The Strange Case of Rachel Kay. Her new book, The Hard Crowd, Essays 2000 to 2020 just came out, and everyone must go buy it. She's been a finalist for the Booker Prize, won the Pre Medici, which I'm probably butchering, and was a two time finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. She's a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow and the recipient of the Harold D. Versell Memorial Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her books have been translated into 26 languages. And our moderator, Reginald Dwayne Betts, is a poet and lawyer and the founding director of the Million Book Project. There are a lot of things he believes are important, but on some fundamental level, what feels more significant than the books he has published and the awards that he has won is that he's helped get three men out of prison so far. His books include his latest poetry collection, Felon, the memoir, A Question of Freedom, and two previous poetry collections, Shahid Reads His Own Palm and Bastards of the Reagan Era. In 2019, 
Betts won the National Magazine Award in Essays and Criticism for Getting Out, his New York Times Magazine essay that chronicles his journey from prison to becoming a licensed attorney. He holds a JD from Yale Law School. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Natalie. That was a great introduction of, of everybody. This is like truly esteemed company. And, uh, and I should just say, starting out, one of the things I find really engaging about this is, you know, we're having a public facing conversation, but we're recognizing that that public um, includes those who are incarcerated. Uh, I know, Rachel, you're on book tour right now, uh, and I, I stand to bet that, you know, a few occasions, particularly during the pandemic, have you had an opportunity to engage with people in prison? I mean, I know that's been the case for me on every book tour I've been on, and and I imagine that it's been somewhat the case for you uh, as well, Susan. But I want to start with how you imagine your audience, because I know, Susan, you inspired me to imagine my audience being people on the inside in, in, in a really robust way. So I think um, before we even break the ice, we're hearing your words. I want to ask how do you imagine who your audience is? I mean, then I'm going to ask if you read a bit for us, Rachel. But if, if both of you can answer that, that'd, that'd be great, just to set the stage for folks who are listening. When I was writing The Mars Room, my last novel, um, I, I wrote that novel, I think, when I was working on it in the day in and day out and then putting it together when it becomes a final product, it's a book and it can have an acknowledgement section and uh, the writer gets to thank the people that helped her make the artistic project possible. It was definitely a book for people inside prison and specifically in California, which is where I'm from, where I live. Um, people in prison had undergone with me a kind of multi-year process of friendship and teaching each other things. And um, I cared very much uh, that they find something in the book that felt true to them and also was, you know, um, I, I don't know, I guess that they felt it was written to them, that it addressed them. Um, my new book, its essays, is called The Hard Crowd, and it does include a very long piece about prison abolition and the brilliant carceral geographer we all know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, which is a piece that I had sent. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't, now you, you spoiling. I, I got that for later. You can't tell people about it just yet. That's, oh, that's okay. definitely going to okay. come up later. Okay, okay. Everybody, everybody pretend like you didn't hear that. There is no essay about Dr. Ruthie uh, Gilmore, but but we're going to come back to that. Um, but go ahead. Tell, tell us who the audience is. Okay. For this, you know? Sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm nervous to talk to both of you. Um, so, so for the new book, I guess because of the way that the experience of the Mars Room taught me who my audience is, my audience for my new book um, is for everyone, including my friends inside prison, some of whom have really developed their own writing and have been publishing it all along. I've been developing in mine and sending it to them. So, you know, it, it, it should include everyone. However, I will say that in California, uh, Dwayne, I haven't had the same success getting my books to people and doing readings here because I, I was basically banned from doing readings at Central California Women's Facility, which th that is really where my people are. Um, it's the largest women prison. Susan knows it well. And I wasn't able to do readings there. But like when I go to other states or when I go to other countries, I'm often invited to read to people in prison, which are always the most exciting and rewarding readings that I do. You differ from me, man. I'm telling you, I love readings like that, but sometimes they are the most daunting and 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 haunting experiences that I've ever been a part of. And, and, and it's not for any other reason than like the stakes feel incredibly high every time I walk back inside those gates. But but um, and I want you to read to us in one second. But let me ask uh, Susan the same question, and I want to frame it this way: uh, Me and you both know Michelle Jones, and she called yours one of her favorite books, right? And, and it makes me think, you know, is your book for women who are remaking their lives after prison, or preparing to do so, or um, or or, or like 
do you actually have a specific reader out there? How, what were you thinking about when you said, I need to tell like this story? Who did you imagine needing to hear the story you had to tell? So I needed to, um, I had to, and I, I needed to put women in the conversation when there's a discussion about mass incarceration. So I needed to transform the thinking of uh, this nation, this world around uh, uh, what what the numbers and what the role uh, of women were in mass incarceration. Uh, when I wrote the book, um, we, we had to scrounge for research about women, uh, about the numbers of women, the numbers of children left behind. They're just so, so, so in, in, in short, I wrote the book to, uh, uh put women in the conversation of ma- around mass incarceration, and then I I I I, I printed soft cop co- a soft copy of the book to intentionally sit with women in prisons and do readings and book signings with them. Um, I I I I I felt like women incarcerated women was one of the most important audiences to read the book that they they that they could understand that no matter how hard life is you have to be willing for, to fight for your life you can't just lay down and roll over and give up and uh, to to encourage and motivate them to stand with us fight with us Walk with us to uh, to transform the discrimination and the, the, the lack of rights for those that have had uh, been incarcerated, and then that will be uh, part of what I read in my chapter uh, later to, uh, in a little while today. And so, so the way we break this down, and I, I now I feel self conscious because <laughs> like I, I'm not the intermediary to to like be pushing this conversation. I mean, I I learn a lot from both of you. I learn a lot from your work, and so you guys got to forgive me for being in this role right now, particularly because, um, you know, I feel like the person who should be listening at your feet, um, particularly you, Susan, and and I have you know, and we know each other, and. And um and I've learned a lot from you and Rachel I've learned a lot from you writing and so how about this I'm gonna back up and I'm gonna stop talking and, and, and Rachel you know one of the things we do and I hope you guys both okay with me calling you by your first names but um one of the things we do with the Million Book Project and with the podcast we produce right is we have the writers read for you know five ten minutes because we recognize that a lot of folks in prison have never heard the story read to them and it's something that's intimidating about the page. That's not intimidating when you hear the voice telling the story. And so we want to uh, commandeer this special event to say, let folks hear what the National Book Project was doing uh, over these past three years in terms of making sure books uh, about prison were being heard. So let's let's make these voices heard right now and these women seen, Rachel, by giving us a little bit of the Mars Room. Sure. Can I add something really quickly? I just wanted to respond, Dwayne, what you said. Uh, about finding audiences inside to be the most daunting. I do agree with that, but I also think that it's why I find those audiences the most rewarding. Like the nights I've gone to read, I mean, a reading that I did once at um, California Institution for Women, CIW, in a certain way was the most exciting night of my life, the most exciting reading I ever gave. And part of it was because people, when I walked in the room, they were not going to just go with it and trust that I had knowledge that was worth their time. They were looking at me like, we've seen a lot of fools come in here and think they can teach us something. And um, it was intimidating. Then again, um, I won them over. And by the end of the reading, they asked the best questions maybe I got in regard to the book, but also the questions were uh, sort of 
reflected like um, an x-ray vision of me standing there because I don't know, in my experience, people inside have social sophistication of a certain caliber that people outside often lack because they're so attuned to having to read people. No. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, just, true. no, yeah, I think that's true. And, and I'm, no, that's true. Let's leave it at that. That that is actually that's that's what I was what, what I was saying when it was daunting. It was you get that thing that um, this is like the hardest reading you are gonna give, and, and if they don't like it, they are gonna tell you they don't like it. You know. Um, that's right. Uh, well, go ahead. Let's see, let's see what you got. Okay, I just chose. Um, I don't know if these are what you had in mind. I chose a couple very short sections that are basically just lists. So this is chapter three. And um, maybe I'll preface it by saying I put together these lists. Well, this list, chapter three, I put together um, after visiting 14 prisons in California. As a visitor, I should say. No orange clothing, no clothing in any shade of blue, no white clothing, no yellow clothing, no beige or khaki clothing. No green clothing, no red clothing, no purple clothing, no denim of any kind or color, no sweatpants or sweatshirts, no underwire or metal parts on brassieres. Ladies must wear brassieres. No sheer or see through clothing, no layering, no exposed shoulders, no tank tops or cap sleeve tops, no low cut tops no unnecessarily exposed body parts, no half shirts or low-waisted pants, no logos or prints, no Capri pants, no shorts, no skirts or dresses above the knee, no pants that are actually long shorts, no shirts without collars, all shirts must be tucked in, no jewelry, one tasteful wedding band is acceptable and will be inventoried by corrections officers at check-in no piercings, no bobby pins or metal clips in hair. Hair must be tidy and pulled back. No shower sandals, no flip-flops, no sunglasses, no jackets, no overshirts, no hoodies, nor any clothing with a hood, no tight clothing. Clothing must not be excessively loose or baggy. Appearance, hair, and clothing must be professional and in good taste. Those who arrive to a state facility in inappropriate attire will be turned away and their inmate visit canceled. Um, chapter eight. And this is a list that I wrote. Um, I guess these are kind of almost like poems, a list that I wrote after spending a lot of time uh, at Twin Towers, which is our LA County jail complex, um, and it's about half a mile from where I am right now. Please provide employment history over last five years. Please be thorough and detailed. On the job experience section of the form, the suspect wrote that she had experience as an employee. The intake officer explained that this would not be sufficient. On the transcript of the suspect's interview with homicide detectives, when asked what kind of work he normally did, the suspect answered recycling. Quality control, she wrote, for type of work. I'm an employee, he told them, but seemed unable to specify what kind. Recycler, maintenance crew, retail, wholesale, flyer distribution, warehouse distribution, dollar store, Dollar Tree, Distribution Warehouse, Walmart. He said he handed out flyers. He had written Recycler. They both worked with a crew that handed out flyers. He delivered free newspapers, but not regularly. He worked at a, he worked at a distribution warehouse. She wrote Quality Control. He said he worked part-time helping a friend who cleaned dollar stores after hours. Cashier, unemployed not currently employed, QC, which he explained meant quality control, truck unloader, package handler. He unpacked crates, he told them, at a distribution warehouse. When asked what she did for a living, the suspect said she worked. Recycling, he'd written. 
He brought recycling to a redemption center, he explained. Recycler, 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 recycler. Redemptions, he told them. Redeemer was what she wrote. The suspect said she had mostly made her living by collecting bottles and cans. Yeah, now they 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 did both sound like poems, and it was interesting. Um, <laughs> I once went to visit one of my homeboys. He was he, somebody I was locked up with, um, and I said I'm gonna go visit him. And and I go there, and I'm filling out the form, and it says, uh, "Have you ever been convicted of a felony?" And I was thinking, how do you define convicted? You know, I'm just gonna say no, and I said no. And, I, and I'm going through the visiting room, and they turn me away. They say, you can't have on jeans. Now, mind you, I had been locked up, and I had visitors wear jeans. So this was completely new to me. I had driven three hours to see this cat. And, I, and it was just my luck that I had some dress clothes in my trunk. And so I changed my clothes um, in the parking lot afraid that somebody was going to see me changing my clothes and then I and then and and you know and then try to put the press on me for doing that then I went back in and I had a bunch of change thinking that you could use the change to you know buy stuff and they were like no change is, is allowed and what was interesting is I had been locked up and I knew the experience of being locked up but going through that it, it didn't make me feel like I was back in prison but it made me understand something about the whole trauma of trying to return. And it made me feel a different kind of kinship with my homie. And so, you know, we sent, we had some questions from these women at Lockhart and somebody said this about the Mars room, Susan. She said, um, this woman named Tiffany, she says, uh, she's locked up at a, at a, at a women's prison in, in Texas. She says, when you're in prison, this is your family. These people are your family. You learn everything about them since you spend all this time with them. And, and I think about Rachel's book and how she is making that real, but I think about your work and how, um, that idea of family didn't stop when you got released. And so what I wonder is what was your impetus you know, if you tell the audience, what was your impetus um, not to let that feeling and that sense of family in with your release from prison? The source of that is understanding the way in which the inhumane practices on our bodies, on our communities, uh, on our gener that's generational happens and the desire to dismantle it, uh, the desire to, are, are, you know, there's this connection that I have, you know, with um, uh, formerly incarcerated women and just people in general that I literally feel their humanity, their potential, their desires, uh, their love, their anger. And um, that sort of stimulates me or drives me to want to actually see it in practice and to remove and dismantle all of the barriers and all of the blocks and all of the, the um, the inhumanity of our of, of folks of our of our community of our children of our our our, our uh, people. Uh, so uh, that's what you know the connection is. And then I feel really connected to formerly incarcerated and incarcerated women because I know what it feels like to be stuck in a place where. People can't see your humanity. They, they, they have. They can't even have an inkling. They won't allow you an inkling of an idea of your potential. Uh, uh, and then they can't even. And this allows you. This, you know, uh, th this kind of blocks your integrity. You know, this unblocks your blossoming into. This, this, this full, abundant, and robust person. 
So that's sort of the, all of it, you know, con connected. I remember, uh, Dwayne, one day I rode, I was riding down Central, Al Central Avenue, leaving the office. And I looked over at this man on the bus stop. And there was an intense pain that came from him and just descended on me and into me. And I was like, oh, God, I can't, I can't handle this. And it dissipated. But I believe that was a moment where I was being allowed to see how immense and intense the connection to my fellow human being can be. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think both of you are, are storytellers. And I think about the film festival, which which is, is actively um, pushing others that had an opportunity to have that empathetic connection with their fellows. But, but what was radical and what is radical about the film festival is the people who you make sure show up to see the films. Um, that was the first time that I had been involved with something where with a where the show wasn't people who were formerly incarcerated as much as everything was people who were formerly incarcerated. And, and when you say community, it was really intentional about about like being expansive and and what that means. And so this next question is for both of you. Um, it's about permission because you know I think permission is involved in all of the work that we do, both in terms of telling our own story, but in terms of telling the stories of others. And so I want to ask you both. Um, who do you think has permission to tell stories about women who are in prison or who have been in prison? And and where does that permission come from um, as writers? And if you want me to ask the same question, answer the same question, I will, too, because I, I deeply believe that my poetry is is fully invested in telling more stories than my own. And I'm often conflicted about whose stories um, I have permission to tell, including friends and, and family members. And so, you know, I ask that with, with true sincerity, recognizing that a lot of our work is walking around with the stories of others um, and, and bringing them to life and bringing them into the air. So I'll ask you first, Rachel, and then and then I'll return to you, Susan. And after that, I'll ask you to read a bit, if, if that's okay, Susan. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a great question. Um, in terms of who has permission, I don't see sort of clear cut rules and rather um, like a set of commitments and an engagement that I make and then make again uh, all the time in terms of, I guess, w w what it would be that I would have to serve or offer as a writer in a world where we do not have one common fate in the way our society is structured, um, if that's a way of putting it. But maybe I could answer it instead by explaining why I authorized myself to write The Mars Room, if that's what I did, um, or what led me to want to try to write a book that would feel true to my friends inside. And I think that part of it is from childhood. Um, we had a kind of um, honorary family member who uh, is now deceased, but was my parents' best friend. And he had gone to prison at the age of 17 for robbing a train and had spent a decade there. Um, and I would say had a kind of somewhat successful re-entry in that he was trained as a machinist while he was in prison. Um, but it very much tempered who he was, you know? I mean, tempered is the wrong word. It formed him. And I was deeply, acutely aware of this as a child. And then um, in junior high, starting in junior high, I had friends who were kind of shunted off into youth authority in California. And then later, did hard time and then 
for whatever, you know, for different reasons, prison ended up becoming their life, um, doing long sentences and dying there. So I was exposed to that world to such a degree that it kind of, for me, I was haunted by it and wanted to understand it. And then I started to feel like as a Californian, as a person who lives here in a county in our state that is one of the big senders, as they call it, meaning so many people from um, metropolitan Los Angeles are being put on buses and sent up the Central Valley to these prisons that are disappeared from view for middle class people because they're in industrial farming. I feel like that is a serious topic for a novelist and somebody who wants to write a contemporary novel wants to write about this world that we inhabit now really needs to deal with it on some level in some form and i felt i was up for that challenge and asked people i had connection to through social activism that i do um if they would teach me things about their lives inside um, and they did. And I can't say that I'm authorized to write what I have written. Yeah, what's going on? Hey, what's up, Sean? Hey, hold on one second. So so this is completely awkward, right? But somebody from prison just called me. Oh my God, amazing. And, and, and I and I had to answer the yeah. phone just because you know people don't get the phone all the time. So let me just just tell him what's going on. Sure. So say sorry, hold on one second, guys. Yo, what's happening, man? Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because I, I I do feel like I mean one of the things about it and 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 um I feel like you know the struggle is 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 hearing people's principal positions and then fighting with them based on those principal positions because I I completely feel that and and in some ways I mean Virginia calls have dramatically been reduced they still um are, are less than free. Uh, I mean, they still are more than free, so it's it's too much. They they pay more for a call than I would on the outside. But but you know, I respect that point, and 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 I think it's important to have multiple points and, and to push that because we need to push the conversation about how completely um, dehumanizing but it is. Dwayne, the fact that I have to pay for the call before I even receive it. I know, I know. I know, you right? know, I have, to put, I have to put fifty dollars or twenty five dollars up before I even receive a call. Is outrageous. I yeah, pay no, for I know. it. I do it. Um, I mean, I guess I just. I mean, you. I, I appreciate what you just said, Dwayne and Susan. Like, it's important to be reminded that I'm participating in a totally exploitative system. But I'm I'm willing to keep my global telling account open and active all the time because I feel like it's very dynamic what's happening here right now in terms of people um, being able to maybe have a shot at clemency. And so a lot of people need to be able to um, communicate with their public defender, their post-conviction lawyer, but a lot of the counties can't afford a global tell link account. San Bernardino cannot afford an account, you know, so people can call me and I can call their lawyer. And no, I mean, no, the, no, the hustle is like, I think the hustle is, 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 is like the way I think about it is I accept calls all the time. I like, and I'd be interrupting readings. I'd be like, Oh damn, I'm on stage. Uh, my man just called me. Give me one second. And the audience is like, what do you mean? One second. And I, I pick up the phone. I'm like, yo, Ab, what's going on? Hey, look, I'm at this reading. You know what? I'm going to put you on speakerphone because you ain't never been to one of my readings before. And then I do the whole reading on speaker. But I think you hear that story and you hear, let me take these calls so that I could connect folks to their lawyers. And you hear, I'm not going to be exploited at all, but I will send you a package. And all of those stories amount to a different, a, 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 a different tactic to get us freedom. And, and I do think that part of what we need to acknowledge, right, is is the efficacy of every tactic, because being reminded of the exploitative practices means that I have to push in a different way. It's not going to stop me from taking the phone calls, but it means that, you know what, 
I'm going to push some other way. And, 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 and I don't know what that way is going to be. And hearing what you're doing, I mean, I represent folks on clemency and hearing what you're doing, Rachel was like, yeah, we got to push that way too. So I like to think of it. Uh, and I want you to answer the question about audience and then read for us. I'm sorry, but I like to think of it as we in this world where too many times, sometimes we allow people to tell us it's just one thing. And I think what I've learned from you, Susan, more than anybody else is, yo, you get out there in the world and, and you do the work and, and, and you make it impossible for somebody to just um, try to assert, you know, in your presence, uh, a, a simplistic version of what the work is. I, I am always impressed by how, how um, I don't know, how you, you just got this uh, gravitas that comes from not fronting with it. And that comes from having, you know, a, a, a true reputation for recognizing a problem and then working to solve that problem. But I, I would love to hear what you got to say about permission and audience and then to hear you read from your book. Based on what I was experiencing, it's experience as a woman, you know, as a formerly incarcerated woman and looking and understanding the impact that uh, the mass incarceration of women, women was having on my community and our communities across the nation, you know, you know, I gave, I guess, myself and steadied myself. Um, I gave myself permission and steadied myself to go back through my life to be able to tell the path to incarceration from as far back as I could remember. And what I can say is that it was, it was, it was, it was hard um, actually going back and visiting and reliving all of those places and, and circumstances and events. So I gave myself permission to do that because I felt I needed to do it. Not so much for me, but for the world and for the nation and for all the other women who did not have a voice. I write about my story, but I write about it in the context of all of us. And people write me and tell me, uh, I get so many letters saying, your story is my story and this happened to me and that happened to me and this is where I was at and and, and, and this is what I want to do and this is what I want to be. But there were, were individuals uh, in my book that I also wrote about. And when, um, you know, I, I have a co-author, Carrie Lynn, when I, when I, uh, you know, there's two sides to every story. So I would say my side of the story, we would write my part of what that individual meant. And then we would... Uh, 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 we would contact the individual and have them put their part of that, of that, of that, of what the role in their lives and whatever we incident or time in my life that they were writing about. And then I sent that story to them, that part of the book that they were mentioned in, and asked them to read it for accuracy and ask for their blessing and permission to put it in the book. And so, uh, you know, that way we had um, a, a rounded out, you know, there's, there's two sides, there's, there's three sides, right? The right side, the wrong side, and the true side. So we hope we got the true side between the two parts of telling a, 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 of the story. So every character that's mentioned in my book, who was living at the time the book was published, uh, had the opportunity to go to to read their their section and, and to um, you know put a blessing on it uh, and I asked for a release from them to 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 use their name and and, and to put that part of the 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 story uh, with the uh, in their name in the book. Yeah, no, that's a uh, so we want to hear some of that, but I got to say that's a really ethical approach to 
to writing. I mean, it's almost, I, I guess, Rachel, you appreciate this because it feels like really journalistic. And I know a lot of people who write memoir, um, they, they, they cop at the beginning to change in names. I mean, I, I changed names, you know, and, um, in my book might've been much better had I reached out to my friends. Um, one, it would have forced me to figure out how to reach out to them because this is pre Facebook when I wrote mine. And so there was no like, like social media to contact folks who you hadn't, or their family members who you hadn't seen in a long time. But I, I mean, listening to you say that, it makes me think really deeply about how I'll approach this next book as as a way to, you know, actually really talk to people who end up getting voiced in the book. But um, we would love to hear you you read a bit, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So um, this is chapter 20 uh, that I'm reading from, and that chapter is The Wall of No. Uh, and some of the numbers have changed since the writing of this book. It's been a few years, uh, and actually, I'm working on my next book, um, uh, 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 Dwayne. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a um, publication party together. We're gonna have a book party. All right, all right. So, uh, so sixty-five million Americans with a criminal record face a total of 45,000 collateral consequences that restrict everything from employment, professional licensing, child custody rights, housing, student aid, voting, and even the ability to visit an incarcerated loved one. Many of these restrictions are permanent, forever preventing those who've already served their time from reaching their potential in the workforce as parents, and as productive citizens. So this quote um, is, the result is that these collateral consequences become a life sentence, sentence harsher than whatever sentence the court actually imposed upon the conviction. Uh, that quote is by American Bar Association President William C. Hubbard. The more women came through a new way of life, the more I saw the same story played out again and again. I watched women being denied private housing, unable to rent an apartment when faced with the box indicating a felony conviction. I waited with them through the paperwork, the bureaucracy of the LA County Department of Children and Family Services as they tried to re reunite with their kids. I saw them morning after morning, iron their sole business outfit and then drop them off. And then I dropped them off and picked them up from job interview after job interview. The outcome of rejection, almost always the same, despite their capabilities. Capabilities didn't matter, neither did skills, past experience or aptitude, the sum of everything else blotted out by a criminal conviction. No surprise, the parole office wasn't giving people any type of real assistance. Out of desperation, some women tried to get social security disability benefits, pointing to how they've been heavily medicated in prison, so they must have a mental illness issue, right? To me, this was no solution. These people with abilities, to have them strung along on a meager payout was basically relegating them to a life of poverty and uselessness. Naively, I had thought that if I could provide shelter and a nutrient environment, everything else would fall into place. But many days, it felt like a new way of life was base camp at Mount Everest. For so many years, I too had come up against these seemingly insurmountable barriers. But I'd done a good job of convincing myself that, it, that my failing was personal, that, was, that it was all on my shoulders. Now a bigger picture was emerging. If you got locked up, you get locked out. It didn't matter that you paid your debt to society, nor did it matter how hard you were trying to get your life back together. 
A criminal history history was like a credit card with interest. So what if you paid off the balance? The interest still kept occurring and occurring and occurring and occurring. Yet I, I remain determined. All over the city, I drove women looking for jobs or tracking copies of birth certificates I fought or filing for Social Security cards. With all this running around, gas upkeep on my, on my old Ford Escort was expensive. And I be, soon began do, doling out bus fare, which led to a bigger issue. I was running out of money. When Stan from Hop told me about the first African-American Methodist Episcopal Church in South, in South Central, gave bus tokens. I showed up there right away. But before issuing me tokens, they asked if a new way of life was a 501c3. I paused and said, what's a 501c3? All right. So, um, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. so that, that was a mean ending, too. I got to say, that was a flair for an ending, you know? Um, yeah. So this is why I wanted to bring I wanted to bring um, Dr. Ruth Ruthie Gilmore up, um, abolitionist, a geographer. I say she's a geographer, um, and, and for the audience, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say I don't fully understand what a geographer is, except that it means that she is um, as a as a as a scholar is concerned with space and concerned with the landscape, and particularly thinking about the geographies of prison, which um, which. I think me and Susan know intimately, but Rachel, you brought up too in terms of the location of prisons and what it does to communities. And her work is is far ranging um, and, and and quite influential. But you know, um, Rachel, you wrote this this profile of her, and, and I think it was the first time that I read um, the word abolition in the New York Times Magazine. And what I want to ask you is, uh, and I'll start with you, Susan, is the piece that you just read, and you talk about the collateral consequences, and you talk about believing that just having a place to stay um, and being nurtured will be enough, but then it's not enough because of everything that happens post-incarceration when people constantly want to hold you down. Um, the question I want to ask you is, do you believe an idea like abolition could cut at those collateral consequences that follow us? You know, um, Would you make the case for abolition based on the fact that, um, that without it, our society has proven incapable of believing a person's prison sentence is done. So even with it, even with abolition, our society uh, is incapable um, at this time as it exists through my eyes today. Uh, there needs to be a total transformation of the hearts and minds uh, of this of this nation. There needs to be an opening and a connection, sort of like the connection that I had with the man at the bus stop. I mean, right now, uh, Dwayne, we're in the midst of a trial uh, where, you know, uh, 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 there's nothing but, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the entrenched depth of racism and uh, power that folks have over other fo folks that was displayed. Uh, there's the uh, not being able to see the humanity or the potential or the 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 the, 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 the humanity of this man and uh, probably this entire community by those that are are in power, those that have power, those that are enforcers, those that rose up out of the the the, the history of this nation. So even with abolition you know, of prisons, there's something deeper that has to happen in this nation and in this world. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I probably would say too um, that a lot of us who, who aren't, uh, who live in check to check or who barely not live in check to check would not have seen that man. You know, I just I just finished reading um Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground. And and what you get in that novel is 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 really somebody responding to what you're talking about. 
and, and, and escape is to go underground. But um, but I like what you said earlier. You got to fight. 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 And um, and, and running is not is not going to settle like anything in these times. Um, Rachel, what would you say to that? You know, what are your feelings about abolition and, and, and how we might move forward in this space? Yeah, I was just thinking about how whenever I talk to Ruthie Gilmore, um, she makes me feel hopeful. And, and she's, I don't think she's unrealistic, but for her, the way that she approaches abolition is all about presence of the kinds of things that Susan rightly points out that we need, which is a completely transformed society. Um, I go through my own ups and downs, I would say, with how hopeful I am about transformative change. It's even lately, it's day to day. We live in a really convulsive time. Um, but like, for instance, I just learned this morning that um, a person named uh, Ricky uh, Blue Sky, a Native American transgender person who's been locked up in Chowchilla for decades, has been granted clemency. And according to some friends who have worked really hard for years and years now to see that happen for this individual, uh, it's the first time that a transgender person in California state prison system has been granted clemency. And they're just going up against so much. People in women's prisons are basically told you have to look like a woman when you go before the parole board. Um, so when I get news like that, I feel good. I feel like there are openings here. We have a new district attorney in Los Angeles, George Gascon, who, if not an abolitioner, as I would put it, uh, like us, is you employing some abolitionist principles, some. Like he's not going to uh, try any minor in adult court, no matter what they've done. And so making those kinds of very firm stands are going to, you know, I think can chip away at the monstrosity of the system. But then there are other days seeing what this pandemic has done to the huge gaping expanse between rich and poor here in California, which if you adjust for housing costs has the highest poverty rate in America, um, it's totally devastating and shattering, and I don't know. And I, I think about um, the moral stamina that's being required of us who are doing this work and well, that, changes that, from day to day. Well, that, that, uh, I, I have two more questions, but but one, I do want to say that um, that that's the thing that's compelling about about your book, Susan, but also about your work is you got a clarity of vision and and a, and and a, and a um. And, and, and an impressive level of um of moral stam stamina and commitment, and I know as a writer, I don't know if you feel this way, Rachel, but I often feel like as a writer, I'm constantly not doing enough work. You know, I feel like as a writer, I live in a world of um of ideas, and so I'm constantly trying to find ways to do things on the ground because it really is hard to do stuff on the ground. But but um so but I have two final questions as we come to a close. Um, one is. Both of your books work to um, to collapse that distance between what we know about the world and what is really happening in the world. And so I wonder if, if both of you might just talk briefly. You know, the Million Book Project is, is, is predicated on the idea that freedom begins with a book. It's predicated on the idea that, um, that really, in a lot of ways, stories are more effective than to, to build those bridges. Um, that sometimes arguments are, you know, really. And so I wonder what both of you might say about the role of of, of telling really compelling stories um, about our lives and about the people that we love, and and trying to um to repair that that thing that um that so many of us recognize as like deeply um wrong with this with with this country um in terms of like poverty in terms of dealing with mental health in terms of addressing violence in terms of um addressing addiction in terms of um 
you know, how many people we lock away. I wonder what you think the role of um of, of story is and 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 thinking about um what to do next. I just I, I just want to say that it's just a huge part of it. Uh, stories, different types of stories. Uh, it's, it's not just stories, but there's uh, concrete facts in stories and information and stats. Rachel just read off this whole visiting list reality that probably a lot of people didn't even understand or know about, you know, uh, 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 and, 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 you know, you convey that. You know, there's these facts, but there's also this emotional turmoil and hardship and pain going through those visitor gates and having that door clank on you and sitting in that visiting room with that with that with that bad food that is a treat for the prisoner. Uh, but stories are really, really important. And, you know, I have to take a moment. And say that, you know, I I was very naive when I started a new way of life. I just felt like if, if women had a chance when they got off that bus, like I had gotten out of, off that bus so many times before that maybe everything would change. And, you know, but, you know, the, the wall of no showed me that it wasn't about getting off the bus. It was about. A dismantling uh, a discrimination and, and racism and all the other things that are a part of this country. But Ruthie Wilson Gilmore and Craig Gilmore, I spent years with in California and they brought my thinking so much around what had happened and what continues to happen, not just structurally. But, but, you know, uh, uh, personally, I remember, and, I, you know, when I told them about the day I was expelled from school because my dress was too short. It was an inch too short, and I got suspended from school, and I write about it in the book. And then Re Ruthie, you know, reflected with me and said, that's the same time. They were integrating schools in the South. And this little white woman, the principal, expelled me and thought I shouldn't be in a book, in a dress from Bullocks. Maybe her daughter should be in a dress from Bullocks, but not me. And I paid a handsome price for that dress. But the reader has to read about that in the book. Hey, but I, I, I will say, I mean... We can't escape it. The, the the personal effects that we have on each other by listening to each other, by telling yeah. our stories to people yeah. who we care about, and by letting them drop drop jewels on us. I mean, I, I think um, I'm gonna tell Ruthie. I'm gonna be like, yeah, you know, you just you just came in. It was the fourth person on our panel. <laughs> yeah, but, she, uh, she, birthed, she birthed my she birthed my thinking. She was a part of hatching a broader analysis of, of, of the world in me. Well, so I should say, see her well, in the bef book. Well, before, yeah. before I, I, I let Rachel talk, you should know that, like, I sent my book, you said you wrote it for women. And you said you wrote it to make women visible. But you remember when I sent it to my homeboy, and he was like, oh, no, you know what? Can I just, I want to say this to, to, to Miss Susan Burton. I want her to know what the book meant to me and he wrote me that note and I passed it on and when you sent that that case of books down there you had it was Dillwyn Correctional Center in, in Virginia you had you know a uh, uh, two dozen men reading your book thinking about their mothers you know thinking about their sisters thinking about their girlfriends and you birthed the kind of consciousness in them so you know we say each one teach one I, I think it, it's, it's a real truth to that statement that um that I've witnessed and yeah listeners if you're inside, we sending a book into you. If you're not inside, you need to pick the book up and read it. Uh, Rachel, tell us what you think about stories. And then I got one cool question to end with. Well, I was thinking of, um, so there's a book by Marguerite Duras, The Lover, that um, I started sending to a few friends in prison a few years ago. And 
I, I wasn't really sure how that book would go over, but for whatever reason, it just became hugely popular and people would pass it around. And it's not simple literature, but uh, it has a vibe to it, I think, that people loved. And um, there's this line by Marguerite Duras, um, a life is no small matter that I was thinking of when you asked that question. And when I ask myself, what is story and why does it matter in this larger project where we're up against, as Susan so brilliantly puts, the wall of no, a life is no small matter to me means lives, in fact, are epic and they have epic qualities to them of drama and gravitas and profundity. I mean, everybody's life and the ability to imagine the epic nature of other people's life for me is part of how I orient myself ethically in the world among other people is to try to imagine their experience and to have some just feel for the textures of difference and what people face, what they're up against. All right. Now that's real. All right. So I'm going to ask you both about the last sentence in your book. I think, um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's powerful to ask folks to reflect on how, on what they chose to leave a reader with. Uh, so this is what you say, Susan. You say, uh, I smiled to myself and then got to work to make sure Beverly had a bed waiting for her. How would you reflect on, on like the, the decision to end the book there? But what would you tell her? Cause, cause I feel like that is a, uh, that could be, your your mission statement right there. So I wonder how would you reflect on that to to our listeners, like the decision in the book there. So um, everybody everybody deserves an opportunity. Everybody should have an opportunity. Um, and to not judge so harshly, to shut the door and exile somebody out um, is is just, you know, um, it's, un, it's, it, it's unconscionable. And that's what happened so much, you know, you know, uh, uh, because because of the hard nature of how we've been trained to think about um, othering and the deserving and the undeserving. So uh, it, it takes courage um, and it takes love to keep it open. And, and that's what we all, I guess, need. Um, I, I know I want more and more and more of it. And then what I can say is that the more that I get it, the more that I give it, uh, and the more courageously I act and, and step through fears and doubts and what have you, the more I get. So it's like a never ending waterfall if I just keep using it up and keep using it up and keep using it up and keep now, giving it up. Now, see, you will see, you'll see what I did here, right? Because I'm going to read this last and I got to read the last graph of Rachel's to get the whole point. But you'll see in my head how you just actually explain the end of her book in a really beautiful way. Um, but Rachel, I'm going to let you explain it, too. But you say, um, I gave him life. It is quite a lot to give. It is the opposite of nothing, and the opposite of nothing is not something. It is everything. Uh, and you talk about why you chose to end there. How would you just like reflect on that? You know. Yeah. So the character who's speaking, Romy Hall, um, has been given two life sentences plus an enhancement of six years, um, which is actually a sentence that was based on uh, the sentence that was given to a friend of mine who's not Romy, not the character's not based on her at all, but traveling through the world disconnected from friends who have sentences like that, I was forced to think about how a person can see her life as having a form of meaning that cannot be clipped and curtailed and killed by the state, even as they have quote unquote condemned her to a life in prison and she has a child she's separated from that child 
She's looking up at the night sky and sees herself as part of a continuum that is so much vaster and more mysterious than the California Department of Corrections can comprehend or, you know, be in a position of control over that in a certain way, for a moment, her life can take on meaning that is outside of that world and bigger than it. Yeah, I, I, we usually in, in in my podcast, uh, the Freedom Takes, the podcast of the Million Book Project, with a question about what does the phrase "freedom begins with a book" mean to you? But actually, I think that you guys have covered it so well. You know, I think that you both have articulated um, how freedom can begin with a book, but all of the work that comes after um, you begin to imagine that freedom and, and so much of it is showing up. So I am grateful to both of you showing up today with me, dropping jewels. I'm grateful for our personal connections. Um, and also I just say again, Susan, seriously, I am, I'm grateful for you pushing me and, and for you taking me seriously. And, 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 you know, a lot of times, I mean, when we get praised by this world, it is real easy to, to think it's the world that first told us the gift we had. But it was always people in prison that first told us the gift we had, that I had, you know. And in terms of the Million Book Project, it was you who first planted the seed that far more was possible than I ever considered. So I am deeply grateful. Um, I thank you both. And, uh, and I'm sure everybody who's watching this has just enjoyed the last hour they spent with us.